Welcome everybody. It's good to see you, good to see your presence um, within our webinar uh, settings this morning. Um, so welcome to this morning's plenary for the Teach at CUNY Summer Institute. I trust you had a restful and restorative weekend. Uh, myself and the rest of the staff at the Teaching and Learning Center are looking forward to continuing our work with you this week and into next week uh, and thinking about um, the plans that you'll be making to develop your courses for this fall. Um, whatever form that may take for you. Um, this morning, we've launched 15 Go At Your Own Pace workshops on the Institute's website, and there'll be a few more to come later in the week. I'll say more about these after we hear from our distinguished panelists today. The workshops are designed to help you all continue the work that began last week, where we as a collective transitioned our thinking about teaching from the theoretical kind of foundational principles that we explored at the beginning of the Institute into the more practic practical, um, actionable pedagogies um, that you'll actually put into, put, put into motion this fall. Um, the Institute, as we've said um, in the plenary sessions and has been reiterated in your, your seminars, is designed to become more concrete over time. And by nature, um, we, uh, within this structure, we've begun talking about undergraduate students at CUNY as something of an abstraction. Um, and this morning's plenary session, which is always um, my favorite uh, experience within the Institute, features a discussion among CUNY undergraduates, and it, it tends to kind of correct for that approach. Um, so I'd like to um, introduce the facilitator of this morning's uh, plenary session, and then I'll, I'll step out. Uh, but want to encourage folks, just as they did last week, to use the chat function, to use the Q&A to ask questions of the panelists, um, and to, to look for opportunities to interact within among yourselves and, and with the panelists as much as possible. So with that, I'll hand it over to Teaching and Learning Center um, fellow Inez uh, Vanya Garcia, and she'll introduce our panelists. Inez, take it away. Thank you, Luke. Uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. Thank you to our four wonderful students who they have been working. Uh, they are taking care of their families. They are still working. And on top of that, they are taking classes this summer. And among all those activities, they find, they find the time to be here with us. And I'm sure that we will be learning a lot from you. So thank you, muchas gracias. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna be introducing four of you, uh, and then we'll start with the questions. Uh, first, we have Vaniqua. She has attended La Guardia, and she will be starting at Queens College, where she's pursuing a bachelor's degree in elementary education and psychology. She is a mother of a beautiful seven-year-old, and she's just trying to make the world a better place together. Victor is a student at Queens College. His last semester is going to be this coming fall. He's going to be a graduate, uh, graduating. His major is communication, science, and disorders, and he's currently enrolled in an intensive American Sign Language course, which is a lot of more challenging than he expected, but it's a lot of fun according to him. Sebastian is a student at Lehman College where he's pursuing a bachelor's degree in film and television and a minor in digital marketing. His most recent projects include a documentary that reveals the life and challenges of Carlos Javier, an undocumented Latino immigrant, and his social, social media video page, Load Up, where he produces a wide range entertainment content in Spanish. And last but not least, Emilio is a student working on a BS in geology at Queens College. He works with his friends in a research lab studying a hydrothermal vent system of the coast of Oregon. And if you ever see him in his morning commute from Brooklyn to Flushing, he would be more than happy to tell you more about it. So thank you, four of you, for being here. And I'm gonna start with Victor. Victor, if you can start the conversation telling us a little bit about a course that you took as an undergrad in which you feel that you learn a lot and what did you, do you think that it made the course effective? Yeah, hello everybody. Um, so there were actually quite a few such courses that I feel like I've learned a lot, but I've noticed a similarity uh, between all of those. Um, I really, like it when the professors engage with students, when they ask questions, when they 
you know, making sure that everybody understands everything, because especially I've noticed that on higher division courses, when it's just strictly lect lecture. So you're just sitting there and you're just listening to the professor talking. There is no interaction between the professor and the student whatsoever. But again, this is my experience and my opinion that has worked for me. I totally understand that there might be some students who do not really feel comfortable answering questions in class. But when it comes to me, it kind of stimulates my thinking ability when a professor asks a question and I'm like, oh, okay, let me think about it. I give an answer and then I get a feedback, um, positive or negative, doesn't matter because it's, it's, it's an effort anyways. And even if my answer is not right, I kind of think about it afterwards and I come to, um, to the right um, answer. Also, I really had one professor this semester um, I've taken a class with her before and actually her teaching style bothered me for a long time. So every time you ask a question, she would never give great response. Actually is very uh, good strategy because sometimes you have a lot of concepts in your mind, but you're kind of like missing a link between them all. So like by figuring out one concept, you can automatically um, arrive to a next concept that you don't understand. So it's the best um, teaching style from professors for me is actually active engagement with students. Thank you, Victor. What about you, Emilio, since you have taken more science classes and we have a lot of people that are going to be teaching uh, labs, we would like to know more about what you think. Oh, great. Yeah. So um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm a geology major at, at Queens College. Um, and I've been really lucky in that most of my classes have a lab component just because you have to see the rocks to be able to work with the rocks. Um, so for most of my classes, there's this sort of engaging component, but my, my favorite lab classes are the ones where we have sort of, um, sort of a guided learning, but we haven't, we can work independently. So we work in lab, um, in our labs, we work in small groups to study. Um, rocks but um, the ones that I enjoy the most are, are the ones where we we have like an objective and we can do it but we can work on our own time or we can work on work through our own methods to find the answer to the problem so my favorite class was probably the igneous petrology class uh, so we used microscopes and field investigations to work through a set of, of samples to, to figure out the story that the, the rock was telling us, essentially. Um, and uh, classes that allow us to sort of really explore the depth of the topic, um, those are the ones I enjoy the most. Thank you, Emilio. Sebastian, all you. Okay, sorry, I had to unmute it. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I find a common denominator here uh, in the in, in Victor's thoughts and Emilio's, and I actually I do agree with them. Engaging is a key component that you definitely have to have in your class. Now, first of all, you definitely have to be passionate about what you are teaching. Okay, because if you don't have that passion, your students are going to realize about it they're not gonna become interested in something that you are not even interested in, you know what I mean? Uh, but sometimes some students uh, don't even feel comfortable with, the, with, with their peers. So one solution that I found uh, in through all my my the courses that I've taken is that the professors try try to um, join them together or try to make them work together that's a better way to put it uh, so that they can get comfortable in the environment in the same class so with their classmates for example allow them to encourage each other to speak up. Uh, how do you do that? So, for example, try to do activities uh, where they gather around and collect their thoughts, and then within the whole class, you can create, um, you can create, you can start conversation with them, and that's just what I think about it. Many 
Shaniqua. Hey, so I want to piggyback on what everybody said. Um, one of my favorite classes that I took in LaGuardia, it was an arts integration class. And basically we had to make lessons where we integrated the arts for early childhood education. And this was an awesome class. Now, the things I liked about this class is that we had to do more teamwork, um, but at the same time, it's also difficult as a student to do teamwork. So I really feel like you guys uh, should understand and really recognize when you see other classmates are doing more work than their teammates or if they're not. So it's, that's really important, but it's also important to be able to incorporate teamwork in the class so basically what we did was made lesson plans and then taught it to the class and stuff and I'm usually not the person who likes teamwork too much because I find myself doing a lot of the work um so I don't really like it but then my teacher recognized that I was doing most of the work and she really sat there and she came to my group and she let us know um, okay, Viniqua, sit down for a second and um, let your other classmate work. And I feel like sometimes that's helpful when a professor can recognize it and come in and, and fix a situation or help. Because it's kind of, I wanted a good grade. So I'm, if my other classmates aren't doing the work, I'm still going to do the work because I want to pass with, with, good, with a good grade. So um, that was my favorite class because it was, it was, um, she incorporated a lot of group work that she watched and that she was able to help us with. And we got to teach the class as students to be able to teach the class. I really feel like we learn more that way, so. Go, oh, Victor, a small comment and I will move to the next question. Yeah, it's gonna be really quickly. I really like how uh, Vaniqua brought up uh, this notion of assessing the classroom. So I've also been a teaching assistant for, th for three semesters. I've been teaching statistics uh, with my professor and uh, some I did teach um, homework reviews or reviews before exams or something like that. And what I've noticed is that when, when, when the student asks me a question about something, okay, first of all, I'm not a professor, so sometimes I don't even know what they're asking. But what I like to do is I just like to ask the classroom, oh, maybe somebody knows the answer to that question. So through that, I can see if I adequately taught the material. So I can see, is it only one person that, does, that doesn't get it or is it quite a few? So, and that again brings us up to, the, um, to this concept of letting students came up with their conclusions on their own. Thank you, Victor. So we have like, as Sebastian mentioned, like structures need to be like really engaged and really passionate about what they are teaching. Uh, Victor also uh, mentioned the active learning component and Emilia and Baniqua uh, mentioned the engagement. Besides all that that you started talking about already, what advice would you offer to all these structures, new structures that are listening to you right now that are gonna be teaching for the first time at, at CUNY this fall? What should they know about CUNY students, about like students like you? Baniqua. Um, I think the main thing to know is that mistakes happen. I feel like it's important for when you get into your classroom to have a discussion with your students so that they understand that you are new and that you will make mistakes, just like any human in the world. Um, I feel like as students, we're more understanding when our professors can talk to us and let us know the real life, you know, instead of coming in the classroom like they know everything and then they mess up something and then the students are looking like, what are you doing, you know? I think it's important to know that mistakes happen and just to have that discussion. Students are human, just like professors. Once you guys become professors, you're going to be human still. So it's important to still talk to us. Um, I also think that it's important to um, engage, like we were saying before. Don't just speak to us. Don't talk at us as students. You need to have conversations with us. We need to figure out what's going on. And it can happen in anything that you're teaching. You just have to try to figure out the way to make it work. And I think that if you do those things, that you'll be fine. Sebastian. 
Yes, uh, I would like to point out that CUNY is a very uh, culturally diverse community, right? So you guys have to take that into account. You're going to deal with a lot of uh, many different types of um, people uh, with different backgrounds. So all the things that you are teaching uh, keep into account that not everyone has the same background and you might have to um, adapt to their way of learning or their way of thinking uh, and keep that into account too. Emilio, would you add something? Yeah, um, so I've taken a lot of lab classes, a lot of science classes. Uh, it, something I've noticed is that the students across classes have a, there's a lot of different backgrounds. And I don't just mean culturally, like Sebastian was saying. Um, I mean, sort of just their, their background knowledge. Uh, we have, in a lot of my classes, there are students that will struggle to work through concepts that involve algebra, you know, doing simple unit conversions. Um, but then there will be other students that really just breeze through topics that involve calculus. Um, so just having an understanding that just the way the degree progressions work, not all of your students will have taken, you know, pre-calculus or even algebra by the time they take maybe their chem one labs or something like that. Um, so just the not understanding the struggles of the students is, is probably pretty important. And then additionally with the, the different cultural backgrounds, the, there are a lot of students that come from, you know, I'm not a traditional student, I'm a little bit older, uh, and to attend classes, I work um, quite a few hours outside of class. I know there are other students that work full-time jobs. So being aware of people's availability outside of the classroom is sort of important to understand the, your students. And that's it. Thank you, Emilio. Victor, you wanted to say something? Yeah, so also some professors really like this technique of teaching that involves literally learning the book word by word. And that, that technique has not worked for me. And honestly, if you think about it, it's a little bit unfair um, and selfish to expect students, especially if they're taking an intro class to something, to know it all. Because you, you are professors, you've spent quite a while to learn those concepts and it took you a while. So you cannot really expect a student to know it all within a period of one semester. So I think it's just important to highlight the things that the student needs to know because there is syllabus. And honestly, most of the time, books have way more information that we need to know. So just be a little bit mindful about that. Don't overload us with information. Even though I am all in for depth of knowledge, but it just gets frustrating when um, the professors just expect you to memorize the book. Thank you, Victor. Vanikwa, you wanted to add something? Um, yeah, I just, I completely agree with what Victor I'm a person that way. Uh, so I feel like it's so important that you can give your students some type of an option like of course like they said you have a syllabus it's so much that you can move things around but try to make interesting and creative things that can make your class fun um, and that doesn't mean making us color rainbows because we're not five but doing something that can help our minds grow while we're learning that's not reading a thousand pages you know thank you Vaniqua. sebastian last comment and we will move yeah, to the next question real quick so try to incorporate different uh, methods of teaching as you guys just said so in different materials so for example if there are people that don't like reading maybe you can use a video a documentary to explain what you what you're trying to teach uh, music is also a way great uh, a, a great way to um, incorporate that in, into your syllabus. So try to incorporate all those things, different things, in order to engage more with your students. That's it. I'm gonna add that Sebastian's uh, documentary would be 
an amazing tool, an amazing resource to include in everyone's courses and thinking about it. So Sebastian, you didn't know about it, but now you do. Uh, but uh, Banico already mentioned one class as one uh, course that she took uh, that she really, really liked and that she really enjoyed for different reasons. I'm gonna ask you guys, what's one assignment from one class, from one course that you took that you really, really enjoy and why did you enjoy it? Emilio. Um, one of the assignments that I really enjoyed from one of the classes that I really enjoyed was well, most of the assignments that I really enjoy are, are some of the more outside of the box um, ideas. So, you know, we, we touch rocks in labs, that's great. Um, but for one of my classes, um, we drafted a, an undergraduate application to the NSF's um, Graduate Research Fellowship Program. Um, and I just thought that was a really great way to include a writing component to a class that it really wouldn't have had uh, a writing component outside of maybe a research paper. But this was sort of further on in the degree progression. So we had already written a bunch of research papers. Um, and, and this was the skill that we would use maybe if we wanted to go to graduate school. So this was just like a really great added component, an engaging component to the class. Um, additionally, we used um, for this course, we had in class debates where we, um, for people, uh, were drafted to a pro side and four people were drafted to an against side for sort of a, a popular research question at the time. And so that really had us engage with the um, maybe a higher level than maybe we needed for the course, but it was it was a really good component of the class that, um, you know, we had a, a speaking component that we might use for sort of like a professional uh, purposes in the future, which it was just a, it was a very engaging way to, to teach the class, I thought. Perfect. Thank you, Emilio. Uh, Baniqua, you wanted to share something. Um, one of my favorite assignments was actually in your class, um, where we we went to Roosevelt, Jackson Heights, and we went to go and ask, basically interview people and um, learn about the community and learn about how people felt and the work environment and everything like that. And um, this, literally every time I pass uh, Roosevelt or Jackson Heights, I tell my family all the time, like, I did that. Um, that was one of my favorite assignments because it was different. Um, we got to leave the school, first of all, and that was awesome because sometimes it's not fun all day, especially when you have class all day to be sitting in a classroom. So we got to leave the school and, and learn. It was like a field trip. And I know like we're old, but it was fun. I enjoyed the, the different aspect of it. Um, it was in it was fun to be able to speak to different people and I like talking and it was fun to speak to different people and get a good grade from it and learn about the environment and the community. And I, I really enjoyed that class because, well, that assignment and that class because it was fun to be able to go and learn, um, learn new things and be able to show everybody and represent LaGuardia too at the same time. So I that was one of my favorite assignments so far. Thank you, Vaniqua. Sebastian? Yeah, so one of my favorite assignments uh, and class was actually Professor Luis Enao, who is also a, a Graduate Center student who was and a Graduate Sebastian, Center student. Sebastian, he's listening to you right now. I just wanted I to I actually just that. realized about that. And that <laughs> Okay, uh, and actually this assignment led eventually to my documentary because in class we were uh, learning about our roots, trying to link uh, or make that connection because, well, I'm from Colombia and I moved about five years ago here to the U.S. And we were trying to explore that part because we were like, okay, when people come here, they try to... Uh, get the culture of the U.S. and they sometimes forget the roots. So we were working, we were working on that uh, and the assignment uh, eventually led to my documentary which is based on undocumented uh, immigrants. Uh, the assignment was made in such, in such way that you don't feel overwhelmed uh, but we divided the assignment in, in two parts and eventually the, the goal was to create a paper um, a research paper based on on what 
well, your roots and your heritage and all these things. Uh, but Professor Luis made it very, very cool, interactive because he actually implemented documentaries uh, and songs, as I, I, as I said before, in order to convey what he wanted to, to tell us. All right, so step by step, we created first the introduction, then the body paragraphs, and it was throughout the, throughout the semester. So it wasn't like just one paper uh, in one week and that's it. But it was more, it, it had, um, what is, what, what's the word I'm looking for? A process, it, it had a process throughout the semester. So that's something very really cool. Thank you so much, Sebastian, for sharing that. Victor, I want to give you the opportunity to talk about one assessment, if you, uh, an assignment, if you want to. Yeah, so um, as Emilio said, um, he really likes assignments that kind of gives you a skill for the future to work in the field. And I actually like those assignments as well, because um, I am about to go to grad school for speech language pathology, and it's about working with people. So we have a lot of assignments that are projects, case studies. When we are presented with a patient, we are given a video, probably a video most of the time. And then we need to write a treatment plan for a patient. Um, and that actually is my favorite way of expressing my you know, thoughts about something because honestly, I feel like multiple choice tests are tricky and it's not really a good way to assess students' knowledge. Um, so I just feel like by writing and explaining your thoughts, why you're doing this, why you think that way, what leads you to think that way, it's kind of better because then the professor can actually change this perspective and this way of thinking, oh, I think you're a little bit confused here. Let me, let me transition you to a different point of view. And that kind of you know, gives the student better understanding. Thank you so much, all of you, for sharing that um, assignments in different courses. Uh, now, all of you have mentioned different assignments that do not require the traditional final paper or midterm and final exam. So let's move into like how to assess the ta this type of, of assignments. How do you think professors should assess how much students learn in their classes? And to your mind, uh, what makes for a good exam or assessment? Vanequa. Um, I think it's so important that as a professor, you don't put anything on your test that you don't remember yourself. Um, I've had times where um, I will ask the professor afterwards of a test and I will want to know like at that moment and my professor is not able to tell me the answer at that moment. And I feel like that's completely unfair. We're learning just as much as you guys are learning and if you don't understand something as you're going through your work, then it's important to let us know and, and fix it in a way that we both can understand. Um, I, I like multiple choice questions, but I feel like don't try to trick us. Um, and this is just something that professors do and teachers. I tell my seven-year-old um, when she's doing her test that the teacher wants to trick you. So be careful. And that's how it is with professors. A lot of times they'll put questions on to try to confuse you. And I know the work, but then I'm still confused. So I feel like that's not a good way to assess. I feel like you should, if you're gonna do multiple choice questions, you should do it in a way where they're gonna understand. Yes, of course you want it to be difficult or challenging to make sure that kids really understand, I mean, well, students really understand, but you don't want it to be frustrating or everything sound the same and you just want to just throw the paper in the garbage and get over the test. I think that's important when you're doing especially multiple choice. Thank you, Vaniqua. Victor? Yeah, so when it comes to assessing a student knowledge, I feel like it's important, I feel like it's important to, um, understand what kind of class that is because there are content-based classes and there are skill-based classes. So when it comes to content-based classes, then multiple choice would probably work best because it's mostly terms, theories, and you know, just, just to see if you understand. Um, but when it comes to skill-based class, um, it's, it's, it's more than that. I feel like for skill-based class, open questions are so much better because, for example, with me, if I'm asked a question, sometimes I'm having a hard time to come up with 
um, an answer like this. So I just need, oh, so if I do this, then that, and then I kind of like lead myself towards the right answer. So I feel like it really depends on the class, but when it comes to exams, I feel like there should be multiple choice and just a couple of, you know, open questions just to see if the students can actually, you know, um, elaborate on the knowledge that they got from the class. Sebastian. Yeah, so I'm not a huge fan of the ABC format, uh, multiple choice exams as well. And to me, well, I would suggest, or well, at least that's what I think, that um, the way to assess mm -hmm. a student is by tracking their, pro their, their how, how, did it, how did they progress throughout the, throughout the whole class. It's not just take, take, uh, to take a test and based on that final test, you decide whether this, this, uh, this student learned or not. Because we all have bad days and it could be or it could happen that that precise day, I didn't have a chance to really study or to, you know? And so not only depending on one single exam, you should assess the, your students, but rather tracking their progress is a, it's a better choice. And you realize that those students actually put an effort in order to enhance their skills and their learning experience. Now also uh, going back to what Emilio said before, there are different students with different uh, backgrounds and in terms of uh, knowledge. And not all the students have the same knowledge or have previously taken uh, classes, special classes that will fit within your, your own class, you know what I mean? So that's important to know. And it's better to track their, their track their, how did they do during the semester, during throughout the whole semester. Thank you, Sebastian. And Emily, I think we need to know more and about assessment and lab, and you are the one who is going to be able to answer that question. Um, well, I'm sure everybody here can answer the question, but um, assessments for, you know, the harder science classes, everyone's already said it already about multiple choice exams, um, but, you know, memorizing small ideas for chemistry, I understand that some of the these classes are used as like reader courses where you want to trim how many people are getting into the, the next steps of this degree. But um, having it be like the Olympics of memorization has never been, but I, I've never found that to be an effective class. Um, and it's not something that I want to, as a student that pays money for my courses, I, it's not something I want to pay money for either. Um, what I have found to be somewhat effective or an idea that I really enjoy is that one of my, um, mentors has this um, structure where he offers his, he, he gives the tests, and then as a way of uh, encouraging students to, to learn the topics, if they didn't do well on the exam, they're allowed to make revisions to their tests. So you, you sort of, you take the test, say you get a C, and then you've got all these opportunities uh, to still learn. Uh, so he encourages them to learn the ideas by giving them points back for correcting their answers. Um, and this idea has sort of trickled down into some of the classes that I've taken. And it works decently well. But one thing that this professor does particularly is he has them give in-person oral defenses of their, um, their revisions to their exams. So instead of just you know, writing down or copying what your friends wrote, um, you have to defend that you know the idea. And I, I understand this is a really labor intensive for um, professors to do, especially if you have you know, 20 people in your class or, or whatever it is. But um, I, I found this to be particularly effective, I think. Thank you so much, Emilia. I thought everybody would be really happy if they had only like 20 people in their classes, I think like 30 or 40. Oh, it's going to become the new rule. But uh, besides specific assessments and uh, specific assignments on general assessment questions, what is something that you wish professors did more in your classroom in a weekly basis or in a daily basis? Or in the other sense, what, the, what you wish professors did less in the classroom? Um, 
I need for the professors to explain more. Um, I'm the type of person who really, really likes detail. I don't like things to be just open to do whatever you choose. Um, I feel like the teachers, the professors need to explain exactly what they want um, or what they're looking for because sometimes what you're looking for is not what I'm doing. So if you're not going to be able to explain everything, you need to have some type of a rubric or something that you can show your students so that they know that they're doing the right thing for their class. Um, and I also want the teachers and the professors to um, engage more, um, really speak to the students as if they're students and that they're humans. I want to know a little bit about you as you know a little bit about me, not just you know have to know everything about me and I don't even know um, who you are and why you're teaching me. I think it's important for teachers to introduce themselves to their students and let them know their background a little bit because you're going to get to know all your teachers. There's so many teachers that I've had um, and my professors and I can't even remember their names because they weren't, uh, not personal, but they weren't um, friendly enough for me to even remember who they were. So I think that's important. Thank you, Vaniqua. Emilio? Um, yeah, Vaniqua was exactly right on this one. I think, you know, taking the temperature of the room, if your class isn't, if they don't understand the topic, it's definitely don't breeze through it. You know, if it's worth learning, it's worth teaching or vice versa, I guess. Um, so just take the time to, to do that well. Uh, one thing I, I, I wish teachers did a little bit more of is sort of um, recitation, um, where you have the, you're using the skills that you're learning in the class to, to solve some sort of problem. So you, it's sort of a reinforced learning. Um, I always love those in my classes and it, I'm sure you can incorporate it in uh, the humanities as, as well. Um, but one thing I, I don't like, uh, and I'm not saying Sebastian's wrong on this one, but um, I think YouTube is maybe a little bit, is leaned on a little bit too much by professors. Um, I don't really want my class to be like uh, a compilation of, of crash, course, crash course videos over the course of the semester. Um, I think it's, it's your job to be engaging. You know, you can tell engaging stories, you can use music, you can use stories. You can use YouTube, but don't use YouTube every day. That's my, you can take that home. Thank you, Emilio. Sebastian, you want to add something? Yeah, no, I actually agree with Emilio. Totally, totally agree. Um, however, something that I, I, I really would like professors to do a little bit more, as Vaniqua said, is try to have that connection with your with your students you know for example in professor luis's class it was a spanish class and one of the things that i really liked is that since it was a spanish class we all had to speak in spanish right so we already had that connection plus he he's colombian i'm colombian uh, most of the class uh spoke spanish they were native speakers so try to find a way to connect your to your students and that way, it's going to be way easier for everyone to interact um, and uh, to actually speak up, you know. And it doesn't have to be a language. Uh, it can be an interest, right, related to the class. But that way, you can connect to, to your students. I'm going to let Victor add something if he wants to, and then we, Vaniqua wants to share something. Yeah, I couldn't really come up with something that I wish they did more or, or less, but I kind of just want to agree on um, establishing connection with the student. Um, I'm that kind of person. To, there was a time when I took this class, I'm not going to mention what kind of class that was, that was extremely boring and I hated it so much, but I liked Professor so much and respected her that I was like, oh damn, like I like her so much, like I have to study. I, and so just solely because I liked that professor so much, I decided that I need to study and also um, just telling students a little bit about yourself because I'm that student who's so going to look you up. I'm going to look up the research that you're doing and what you've done before because I need to know what kind of person is teaching me. As Emilio said, I'm paying for my classes out of my pocket so I really need to make sure that I'm getting the best out of it. 
Vaniqua. Um, I like what he just said. That was a good one. Um, but also, I want you guys to understand too that there has to be a balance. Um, we're saying yes, we want you to talk to us, we want you to find a connection, but at the same time too, we don't want every class to go to you talking about your dog who sleeps in the garage. Like a lot of times the professors, um, they want to have that connection with their students, but they don't stop talking. And then I find myself not learning anything by the end of the class. So it's important to find a, bal a balance of being able to connect, but being able to get to class. Make sure you're connecting so you're getting to your classwork. Um, so I think that's extremely important, uh, going off what we all just said. Thank you, Aniqua. Thank you, four of you, for sharing. And all of you were taking classes this spring semester when everything happened. Uh, I'm not gonna spend time uh, describing the situation, but uh, how did the shift to distance learning in March impact your experience with, in every single aspect of your life as a student and as a mom, as a brother, and so on? Victor. So when it comes to work life, I work in healthcare, so it didn't really impact me that much, except for it became a lot more stressful to work. Uh, but when it comes to academia, it's been challenging. It's been very hard to study home, to, you know, listen to those lectures and just, you know, being very disciplined and everything. But, um, I understand that it's been hard for all of us, not only students, but professors as well. But when professor makes an asynchronous classes and there is no communication with the students whatsoever, it's very hard to study. Like, for example, I had another class this semester. The professor was so communicative and so engaging. She encouraged everybody to turn on their cameras when we had meetings on Zoom. And yeah, some people may not be okay with that, but I feel like it really enhances the communication and this connection with the professor. So I feel like if, if we're talking about online classes, it's very important to keep that connection, not be just like, oh, I just posted a three hours lecture, please watch it and memorize everything. No, that's not gonna work. Maniqua. Um, for me, it was difficult um, for some of my classes because um, I had internet connection loss and um, I didn't sign up for an online class. And then for some classes, for me to go, like my Spanish class, for me to go from being in front of my teacher to going to Spanish class online, it was, it was difficult. Um, and then also I have a seven-year-old, like I mentioned, and my baby girl, she was in class as well. So I had to help her while I was trying to do my own classwork. Um, and that made it extremely difficult. Um, one of my professors, he was so understanding and he helped me um, get a new laptop when I was having connection problems. So I feel like if you guys will have to do, deal with this as a professor, you should be extremely understanding that, of course, everyone, like Victor said, everyone is dealing with this problem. But I think it's important that professors understand that Yes, I'm dealing with it, but my students are dealing and so much more probably as well. So the only reason why I was able to get through it is because of the understanding of my professors. They, they really helped me out and um, I was able to get really good grades because I worked hard and even though it was difficult, but them being able to really understand my challenges and try to help me and work around it, especially something like this that just popped up out of nowhere. Like when you, it's a difference because when you sign up for an online class, you know what you're getting yourself into. But if you sign up for a class that was not supposed to be online and then all of a sudden you're online now, you don't know exactly what is to come. And the professors don't even know what is to come. So it's important to just be under, understanding. That's my key uh, word for this question. Just be understanding. Sebastian. Yes, um, it was also a little bit challenging for me. 
uh, as Vanico said, yeah, when you sign up for an online course, you know you're gonna have to uh, do online homework and all these kind of things. Uh, however, you also have to understand that, well, for example, at least in Lehman College, which is located for those who don't know, Lehman is located in the uh, in uptown in Bronx, in the Bronx. And so something that's really key for you to understand is that not everyone has a computer, nor not everyone has internet connection. Yeah, we all uh, deal with different challenges. Uh, and I don't know if you maybe remember, but in CUNY there was this uh, break of online, what, what was it called? Um, restructure, I don't really remember, but the idea was that uh, they were going to give us more time, like eight more days, in order for the students to adapt to the online classes, uh, because not everyone had a computer, not everyone had internet connections. Uh, so that's key, as Vanico said, understanding of the situation that uh, all the different students are, are going through, and then not, not everyone has the same accommodations, essentially. So try to be understanding of that as well. Emilio. Yeah, I think everybody's talked about how it, it sucked. It really sucked. Um, so <laughs> we can talk about what the teachers did that worked really well. Um, part, of, part of what was difficult about the online classes is that uh, it doesn't really feel like you're in a classroom. You know, it's when you're in a classroom, you have the, your friend that you sit next to, you have your, you can say hi to the professor before class or after class. If you're a professor, maybe you can pull your students aside that maybe haven't turned in their assignment in a week, or you see them struggling a little bit in the class. But that doesn't that doesn't really happen in, in this Zoom universe. Um, so for the the teachers that that made it work for me, there was I had two professors at Brooklyn College that that really made it work. Um, my math professor, and you don't think of math as being like the empathetic science, but my math professor really stayed in touch. Uh, Diana Hubbard, she stayed in touch with. The individual students. She had like 30 kids in the class. She was teaching, I think, two or three classes, some ludicrous amount, but she stayed in touch with each student and got their work in um, and just did a really good job of making it feel like you were still a part of her class. Um, math classes aren't really known for their dynamic classroom environments. So my other class was, um, I had a, a geology class at, at Brooklyn College with uh, Anna Poltseva. Uh, and one thing that she did really well was she encouraged us to use video in the class and people were changing their Zoom backgrounds and it was, it felt, it felt fun and you felt like you were in a classroom, you had this, it was a really good learning environment. Um, and we were all emailing each other outside of the classroom, so it, it felt like, you know, we were building relationships like we would in a, a normal classroom. Um, and I think that has to do a little bit with how she ran her class. And I, it has a lot to do with the students as well. So, you know, if you have a, a good batch of students, you know, let them be students. Thank you, Emilio. Thinking more about this like online environment or as Emilio described it as a Zoom world, uh, what are the strategies and approaches that really work during these online times? And Emilio was kind of like uh, giving us a couple of examples already. What, how do you think that we can maintain, instructors can maintain, maintain a sense of classroom community, relationships, connections? Connections has been, have been mentioned before at the beginning of our conversation have been like key, a key component uh, to teaching. So how can we uh, keep going with that in an online environment? Vaniqua. Um laugh um i think it's important to laugh um you should know that well you should tell your students that it's okay it's gonna be okay let's laugh it through figure out some things that are funny and get the work done um because there's nothing that you can do you're in the situation and that's how it is so the best thing you can do is try to make it better and i think laughter helps Sebastian, anything that helped you or really did work uh, during the half, the second half of the semester? Yeah, well, definitely communication as we all agree on. Um, because there was, at least right now I'm taking a, a class, just a film class in the, during the summer. And you really have to be, or be involved in the class. 
because for example, let me explain better. This class that I'm taking right now, I don't like it at all because the professor just posted the things on Blackboard. He said, okay, here's the work, get it done by this date and that's it. To me, that, that wasn't really engaging. Um, I mean, I've been doing, of course, the work and all these things. But honestly, learning, learning, I'm not really learning. That's that's just the, the honest truth. Um, so try to communicate to your students through Zoom. Uh, try to use uh, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, which is also an important tool that every every student knows how to use. Um, and basically communicate with your students. Try to have a conversation with them. Aniqua, I know you want to say something. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, just piggybacking off what he said, um, it's important to, yes, communicate, and um, like he mentioned, he was taking a class that uh, he basically didn't like. I think that professors need to tell their students exactly what the class structure should be or what they want it to be from the beginning so a student can decide whether they want to stay in this class or try to figure out a way to get out of this class. Um, Sometimes students just want to have the assignments up on the internet, do the work, and don't have any interaction with the professor. That's how it is sometimes. I know that I've been there sometimes, and sometimes students need the interaction, and I've been there sometimes as well. So it's, it, it's so much that a professor lets us know from the beginning how the class is supposed to go, how the professor is going to interact, whether the professor is just going to put up work and let you do it as you please, or whether the professor is going to do assessments every couple of days to see how the work is. So that the students have the opportunity at the beginning to know whether they want to ride through this class or not. Thank you, Maniqua. Victor, I know that you are taking a summer course and you were also taking classes uh, last spring semester. Could you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, so I mean, it's, I feel like it's very easy to talk about like, oh, it should be this way, it should be that way. But I just want to kind of like defend professors that it's also very hard for them because I've been a teaching assistant and I transitioned to online and it's been hard. It's been, it's, it, it feels different um, teaching, sitting in your room um, as opposed to teaching in an actual classroom because in an actual classroom, you see this feedback, you see students' eyes and it is hard for them as well. Um, but what I'm almost against, um, what I'm also against for is um, asynchronous classes that I don't like because it's just, you know, this one class that I'm taking right now, it's just a lecture and it literally feels like the professor just reading the outline in the microphone and there's no like change in pitch, there's no like, you know, nothing. It, really feels like he's reading a book as he teaches. And then like, you know, he sneezes, he coughs, he yawns, he, you know, it's just hard. But I, at the same time, I understand we're all people. So I feel like the classes should be synchronous unless it's, um, it also depends on the class. If it's an easier class, yeah, it can be asynchronous. If it's a little bit of a harder side, then I feel like it should be a synchronous class when you can ask the professor a question right there. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. Emilio, do you want to add something? I know that you already like mentioned a couple of his strategies, but if you want to share something else? Um, sure. I think, you know, if you can encourage your students to use their video functions on their, um, on like your Zoom calls or, or whatever you're doing, um, I think that you can sort of, it can feel like a classroom a little bit in that you'll, you'll see their eyes, you'll see who seems to be understanding, who's nodding their head, who's shaking their head. Um, I think that could help, but you can't, it's harder to have expectations because, you know, some students, they won't be, they won't want to use their video function. Maybe they're self-conscious um, self about, you know, their living environment or maybe they don't have the video camera. Um, Sebastian mentioned Blackboard Collaborate. <laughs> I mean, some of the problems are, I've never used that before. I don't even know what that entails. Um, you know, I've used WebEx for one class and, and Zoom for another class. And it can be difficult for the student with all of these different um, apps that we use. Um, but, you know, try and get them to use video uh, and understand that maybe they don't know how to use the apps, just like you maybe don't know how to use the app. 
Thank you, Milila. There are so many apps, so many options, and it's important to be flexible. I'm going to start like moving to the questions of some uh, of our audience. And I know that you have talked about time. You, many of you are working, many of you have families. So how do you feel about the amount of homework and study time outside the class? Uh, think about next fall. Uh, what do you think is too much homework in an unrealistic way? Emilia? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so for some of the harder science classes, we use online learning software. Um, and it's, it's self-paced, so if you complete a module correctly, or if you, if you pass all the assignments correctly, if you answer all the questions correctly, you get to move on to the next one. What might happen is you might not answer them correctly. So you get stuck in this. In that sort of class, it's good because you, you know you're learning something and, and you're, you're active, um, and that's great, but you can, it can feel overwhelming at times. For other classes, you know, you can just assign a reading and maybe the student understands it, maybe the student doesn't understand it. So they could, maybe they read six hours a week or maybe they read one hour a week. Um, it'll be different for each student. Um, it's hard to know what the, what the right amount of homework is because the, each student is different. Paniqua, and I know that you mentioned uh, that you work, you have a kid, so let, tell us a little bit more what you think would be too much work. Um, well, as far as online classes go, I feel like homework is like a tad bit, um, not, not very useful for me. I feel like it's more stressful to do homework. I'm already worrying about being online and making sure I know the knowledge to be online with my class and be productive with my professor. And I feel like doing more homework is a lot. And I am a student, I love to do my work. I, I love classwork, but if I'm already stressing about being in class and with these online classes, you have to be prepared. So I feel like that should be your homework, being prepared for your classwork, whether that be be writing a short paper or reading material or having a project that's done beautiful but just other unnecessary work is unnecessary to me when you're in a regular classroom homework is not unnecessary because you want your students to learn once they go home you know but if you're in an online classroom your student is learning already while they're home i don't think they need extra at, for me in my opinion i don't need more work on top of it and um like you said i have a seven-year-old i volunteer every week at least three times a week i work full time so being online is enough uh, for me maniqua i'm gonna ask you a question um what do you, how would you describe unnecessary homework, unnecessary homework? What is like the difference between these two? Like okay. thinking also so, about an online environment as you describe. Yes. So unnecessary homework for me would be homework that we're not, that is not going to be useful in the classroom. So that can be, if I'm taking a class, um, for arts, and, uh, for arts and integration class. And I was, there was a class that I was mandatory to have to go to a um, museum. And for me, this homework assignment was unnecessary because it was really hard for me to fit this into my schedule. And this is when everything was fine. And then for the fact that it was mandatory that I went, um, I. Feel like I should go because I want to go when I have the time not driving myself crazy trying to figure out when I can do that now when you have online classes this is something that would be extremely unnecessary because 
if I'm online, I'm already doing the work that I need to do so that I can be able to interact with the professor. So I feel like the professors should assign assignments that will allow the students to be, to have engagement in the class, but not necessarily have other things that they don't have the time for. I feel like it's, for me, it was, it was unfair for me to be forced to go somewhere in order to get a good grade because I already don't have the time, you know? So I feel like things like that is, is unnecessary. And as far as online classes, if you, if it's not going to better your knowledge, then it is unnecessary. And I think it's important too to talk to the students so that you can know what will better their knowledge because it can be different from other people to other people, you know? Yeah, I think uh, asking a student and making them participant also uh, active in that decisions. And I think that what you mentioned about the assignments, having a purpose, make them necessary, but if there is no purpose for that specific assignment, maybe it's not necessary, as you yeah. said, Vanikwa. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Victor. Yeah, so I really like this term of unnecessary assignments. I've used it before as well. Like for example, this semester I've taken a class about communication in school amongst um, teenagers and um, older teenagers. And when they, the whole COVID-19 thing happened, professor just decided to assign us a paper on COVID, um, 10 pages paper, IPA, five sources. Um, just because she felt like we need to know more about it and I'm um, you know I was just sitting there like 10 pages like are you serious it has nothing to do with the class um, so yeah that is a bright example of unnecessary assignment also um, what I feel like un unnecessary is assigning reading material on things that you've just taught why would I spend my time on reviewing same exact concepts if I just went to lecture, let's say, if it's in person lecture, um, and I spend my, I don't know, mental capacity to understand what you're talking about and then go home and read it again. Um, it should be an optional thing, obviously, to supplement your knowledge, but definitely not um, a, a mandatory thing. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. Sebastian, would you like to add something? Yeah, well, I do agree with Victor and Baniqua uh, regarding the uh, those homeworks might be unnecessary and necessary. On the other hand, you have to take into account what we were talking earlier, that uh, CUNY is a very uh, diverse community. And so in right now we have, for example, Baniqua, who doesn't have a lot of time because he has to take care of his children and she had to do some other stuff, right? On the other hand, you might have this uh, student who just got out of high school and he's used to doing work, homework, and doing all these kind of things. So I, I think you gotta have a balance. And how to know that? Honestly, I don't know. But you, you have to talk to your students, you know? Learn, uh, learn about them. Um, are they busy? Are, are, are they not busy? How, how much do they want to do? How much do they wanna read, maybe, right? But you have to take into account that it's, we are all different. It's a diverse environment. And you have to take that uh, into account when doing homework, when leaving homework for the students. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, Paniqua, last comment, I will pass to the next question. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, what he was saying about mandatory, what we always saying about mandatory. You can give the students the work, but I think it's the balance that you need to find is what is mandatory and what is not. And I feel like as professors, you shouldn't say it in the way where basically if you don't do it, you won't get a good grade because I'm the student, I want an A. I want an A in everything. So if you tell me to do something, I'm going to do it, especially if I know it's going to affect my grade. No matter how much I don't want to do it, I'm going to do it because I want an A. But if you just tell us, well, you can do this to help your knowledge or help you better understand and if I already understand I'm not going to do it if I don't have to if I don't really feel that I need to so I feel like being really specific on what is mandatory and what will actually 
further help you, uh, further help your students is important. Thank you, Paniko. I think that you are bringing up like a really important aspect about flexibility and maybe like giving more options, like different options to complete assignments. Uh, and all of you have mentioned uh, asynchronous and synchronous as both modes that you already experience. Uh, there is a question regarding the balance. How much of each? Where is like, where is the right balance? in your opinion, what do you prefer? Emilio. Um, for me, I think for a lot of people, if, you, you, if you're taking classes, and we've all taken classes, then you're taking classes in the classroom. So to provide a sense of normalcy, um, you know, to get your system, we all have our systems for doing our homework and getting our study groups together. Uh, I think having, Synchronous learning is pretty important because it fits with the systems we already have. Um, I, I think when you sign up for an online class, you know that maybe there'll be an asynchronous portion of it, so you know what to expect. But if you aren't signing up for an asynchronous class, if there's a if there's a time listed on the schedule, I'm taking that class at that time for a reason, and that's because it fits in my schedule. It's because I want to feel like I'm in a classroom. Um, and for me, it's it's pretty simple. Victor. Yeah, so I agree with what Emilio said. Um, but as far as percentage goes, I feel like 50-50 is good. Um, as CUNY likes to do hybrid classes, like one lecture is actually there um, in person and then the other lecture a week, uh, students just dedicate on to study on their own. And I actually took such class this semester uh, in spring past semester and then a transition online and that have worked for me pretty well um, that all oh, I have to dedicate like one and a half hours um, live and then I'll just have to study on my own so I feel like that balance is good. Aniqua. Um, I can't really say like a percentage I can't really say I feel like to me I feel like you should speak to your students before I think every class is different Every student is different, every course is different. So you just need to speak to your student to get an idea of what will better help them, help you teach them. So I feel like that's, that's your best bet to me. Sebastian, do you wanna add something? Honestly, I'm with Baniqua. I, I totally agree because we are all different, it's a different, um different classes require different uh assignments also so yeah just ask your students and it's tough what you guys are gonna your work because as i said you're gonna deal with a lot of different people different students different methods of of learning so it, it's not something easy but as you as you progressively go into your career you will you, you will understand a little bit better and i believe that uh, having your students feedback and knowing what they what what thank you Sebastian uh, not knowing is fine and I think our uh, audience doesn't know so I think it's really good that they ask for feedback uh, from their students I'm gonna like kind of like combine two questions uh, and it's gonna be our last uh, question our uh, instructors are working with the syllabus right now for next fall. So could you tell us a little bit more about your experience with the syllabus? Like, do you use it? What kind of information do you think is useful in your syllabus? Like, do you go back and check your syllabus or not? And uh, regarding that, also, how do you think about deadlines? How, like, how strict uh, do you think instructors should be about deadlines uh, or, and, uh, extensions. Uh, where is this flexibility in our online teaching that is expecting, hopefully expecting, uh, us, like we're expecting next fall? Anyone? Maniqua, you will start. Um, okay, so as far as deadlines go, I feel like they're extremely important. For me, I know this might be difficult, what I'm going to say for um, students who are just getting out of high school and don't really know the structure and sometimes they need somebody on their back. 
for me personally, I do not need a professor on my back. Just give me a deadline and I will do the work. Um, it's important, especially times like this or especially online classes, you're taking an online class for many different reasons, but a lot of reasons why I would choose an online class is because I don't have the physical time to go to the school or do the specific things that the professor needs me to do at that specific time. I know that I know how to work my time around. So I feel like it's a good thing that you give deadlines and be very stern with your deadlines. But also, like I said before, be understanding because things happen. Of course, don't let students just walk all over you and just always have something happening. But it's important to be understanding that things do happen, but deadlines should be stern. And this will be a way for those kids who are getting right out of high school and starting their college career, it will be helpful for them to learn responsibilities. Uh, as older students, we know responsibility already. We know when something is due to get it done, but this will help the younger students to be able to learn um, when some things do, how to start and how to get it done. So that's helpful. Sebastian and then Victor. Yeah, I definitely agree with Aniko as well. Deadlines are extremely important um, and that teach the students to be responsible, as you said. For example, uh, from my perspective, I use deadlines for absolutely everything because since I am a filmmaker, I do videos, I know I have to do a video by this time, otherwise I'm not going to get paid or I'm not going to uh, progress in that project, right? So it's important to, to teach students that. Um, now, in terms of the syllabus, I'm going to be totally honest. Most of my my peers, my classmates, including me, I don't take a look at the syllabus, honestly. I, I just take a look at it when I need to know, for example, the, e uh, the professor's email, maybe their office hours, but that's also important that you yourself tell them, uh, hey, this is my office hours, you can come whenever you want. Um, and we can have a talk about this or that, you know. But I know the syllables are important too, but we as students, we don't really pay attention to uh, to everything that's written there. That's my, that's what I think. Thank Sorry. you, Sebastian. They have been working on the syllabus for a week now, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> Victor, and then Vaniqua wanted to add something. Yeah, honestly, I never look at syllabus. The only section that I look at is uh, percentage grades. I only look at, okay, what I need to do, because honestly, attending classes is pretty straightforward to me. You just go, you study, you take exams, that's all. I don't really need to know anything else. Um, but as far as pandemic goes, um, I really did look at syllabus a lot just to see the dates and what we're kind of on, because it's been, especially if the class is asynchronous, I just, like, I. I don't quite remember what chapter we're on. You know, sometimes it gets crazy. So yeah, if it's an online class, then I look at grade percentage and um, the actual schedule. But normally if I go to classes, I only look at grades. That's all. So I don't think you should worry about syllabus that much. If there's something you need to say that's very important, just, you know, emphasize it in class and that would be sufficient. Maniko, I'm gonna let Emilio participate and then I'll be back to you. Um, so I'm going to be the voice of dissent. I really love the syllabus. Um, it's, you need it. I mean, I have so much going on in my life and I really live by that calendar. Um, I use it, you know, for my math classes, they're all different and I want to know how my grade's going to turn out. So I use the syllabus constantly as a grade calculator. <laughs> I use the syllabus for, I want to know what homeworks are coming up. I want to know what reading's coming up. I want to know if I can get ahead. I want to know if or behind I am. I use the syllabus all the time. I have like, you have a little download tracker when you download the same document over and over again. I'll have like 10 downloads of the syllabus over the course of the semester. It's, I hate, I live by the syllabus. Vaniqua, you wanna? I am team syllabus. I love the syllabus. I feel like I can't do my class if I don't know exactly what I need to do. And I feel like a good syllabus is helpful because I don't need to raise my hand and ask you every week, what are we supposed to be doing? 
or what is supposed to be due this week or what are, what am I going to learn? Um, like Emilio said, I like to sometimes get ahead and I like to plan my week. So I like to know what I'm going to learn so that maybe I could do a little bit of research beforehand or maybe if, like he said, if I'm behind for some reason, I know how to catch up. It's also, I like to know about the course. It's a lot of times, as a professor, you need to make sure that your syllabus tells a little bit of background. I like to know what other students have learned in this course, and I like to know what is important that I'm going to start learning. Um, I like the fact of the syllabus that it has the integrity part in it, just to remind me um, and remind other students, mainly not me, but to remind other students that you got to follow the rules because sometimes students forget and they think they, they, they can do whatever they want because they're in college, you know? I, I love the syllabus. It's, it's so helpful to me. I think the key points in the syllabus of, is, of course, the scheduling, um, background of the class, grades. I love grades. Um, and, a, and a very detailed structure of how grades are going to be conducted of how you do your work. I'm that type of person as soon as I'm finished with an assignment, I'm looking in the syllabus to see what my grade is going to be. Or before I even start my assignment or my project, I'm looking in the syllabus to see what I can do to make this grade what I want it to be. So I feel like the syllabus is important. Team syllabus, Emmanuel, I, I totally agree with you. Sebastian, we have yes. a minute. If you want to add something super quick. Super quick, yeah. I just wanted to mention that I love this group of students. As you can see, this is what you're <laughs> going to encounter at CUNY. You see, there is no wrong or right answer. It's just something that you have to adapt and follow, um, something that you progressively will learn, you know? So look at the different uh, thoughts that we have here, and it, there is no wrong or right answer. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Sebastian. I think that basically you did uh, the wrapping up for me, like the conclusion, because that's where I was going. Uh, but besides like all the different point of views, what we did really learn from you guys is like how important is like understanding. I think like understanding has been like a really key word in this conversation. And also like making your students active participants of everything since syllabus creation to assessment to assignments. So ask your students would be kind of like I think like the advice uh, number one that we can be uh, we can give to our new instructors uh, I want to thank you thank you thank you muchas gracias to like four of you for taking the time I know that you are taking courses that you are really 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 busy so thank you again for being here with us and sharing all your experiences I'm gonna give uh, Luke uh, some time because I know that he wants to say something about the Institute thank you again guys Thank you, Inez, and thank you, Victor and Vaniqua and Emilio and Sebastian. Um, that was really powerful. Um, so important for us to hear your voices. It's going to resonate um, through the rest of the Institute. Um, we have seminar meetings tomorrow and on Thursday, and I want to encourage the attendees, first of all, to kind of virtually clap um, for our guests today, to thank them in the, in the chat, um, and to really let their words resonate um, as you go into your planning and, and there's so much to take from this and to, to reflect upon. Um, and the, the syllabus question, and I think the really thoughtful responses on both sides of it is just an example of the richness and complexity um, of the work that we do with our students every semester. So thank you again. Um, and uh, we're, we're in your debt and wish you all the best of luck. Um, so I'm going to say just a few um, words here about the um, about the workshops which we launched this morning, um, just to kind of contextualize them just a tiny bit uh, more for you all as you're going into the, the rest of your work at the Institute. Uh, again, these workshops are designed as go at your own pace experiences that allow you to dig deeper on a topic or a skill um, or a methodology or a philosophy or an approach um, that we're certain has come up at a certain point, um, either in the conversations with faculty members in your seminar uh, or in today's uh, plenary session. Um, and um, many of these are, are, are compiled readings with some suggestions for how you might work with them with either through a worksheet or through a sample assignment. 
that you can then submit to us for feedback. Um, these are all annotatable. There's uh, Hypothesis, which is a web-based annotation software, um, is active on all of the workshop pages. So feel, feel free to leave us your comments. Um, we, um, and I wanna give a lot of credit to the TLC staff here who I'll name in a moment, um, really re-envisioned what these workshops will look like over the past two months um, and redevelop them um, to, again, both address the, some of the foundational questions that we work with when we're beginning teachers, um, but also to increasingly acknowledge our context, um, which, uh, as you all know, are swiftly, swiftly evolving and are, are creating all sorts of questions that we have to grapple with as, as teachers and as students. Um, so um, give us your feedback. That work we're going to carry forward. We're going to continue to revise it going into next academic year. So the more you kind of give us, the more we can incorporate that into the into what we, we give back. Um, and um, again, I just want to thank the TLC staff members for their hard work, their presence, their commitment during these challenging times as exemplified in the structures of the seminar um, and all the work that went into the workshops. Um, so Asilia Franklin Phipps, Caitlin Mondello, Luis Hanau Uribe, Lori Herson, Mei Ling Chua, Talisa Feliciano, Kyun Kim, Sakina Laxmi Moro, uh, Inez Vanyo Garcia, who did a wonderful job today, Avra Specter, John Zayak, um, Christine Kahn, um, who is uh, not only part of our staff, but she's also an attendee at the Institute um, this, this summer. Um, and then we were very fortunate to have Lindsay Albrecht and Fernando Blanco Vidal join us as summer peer mentors, um, running our TLC chats and launching a couple of workshops. So a uh, round of applause to all of you folks. Um, dig into the, uh, the workshops and we will see you all uh, in your seminars later this week um, and on our Slack channel. Again, big final round of applause for all of our panelists. Inez, any last words? No, thank you again. Uh, I hope to hear from you on all your projects in the future. Uh, I already told Sebastian that I'm going to be at Lehman next fall. So I want to know more about what he is working on. I uh, know Victor is applying for grad school soon. So that uh, letter of recommendation is coming up for sure. Uh, Vaniqua, uh, I know she's going to be doing great things at Queens. And I cannot hear, I cannot wait to hear more about her kid and Emilio that Oregon project I have no idea but I hopefully see you one day in your commute from Brooklyn to <laughs> flashing and you will be able to tell me more about it thank you okay be well everybody bye bye <laughs>